Welcome to We the People, a Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, President of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us. Too often these days we focus on what divides us as a nation, so I'm really pleased today to discuss something that strengthens our sense of community, and that's the arts. Wind and Harry Bradley and their families were deeply committed to the arts, believing that they're essential to a vibrant civil society. And the foundation strives to carry out that commitment to this very day. It was almost exactly one year ago, along with Harry Bradley's grandchildren, David and Line Deline, and David's wife, Julia, uh, when we announced a joint $52 million gift to the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra's new performance hall. The foundation's portion of that gift marked our largest contribution to a single project in our 35 year history. And fittingly, the symphony or MSO named its new home the Bradley Symphony Center to honor the Bradley family's impact on Milwaukee's cultural scene. My guest today is Mark Niehaus, president and executive director of MSO. Mark is a New Orleans native, started his professional music career while still a freshman at the Juilliard School. He was the principal trumpet of MSO and has led the symphony for the last nine years. Mark, welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you for having me, Rick. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Let's jump right in. It, you know, it's really hard to believe that it was a year ago that we were at the site of the symphony's new home for the naming announcement, and then, unfortunately, the pandemic hit. Tell us how the past year impacted progress on the renovation and construction of the Bradley Symphony Center. There had to be some challenges. Uh, that's an understatement. <laughs> but actually, first, I want to I want to say thank you to you and our friends at the Bradley Foundation for your unbelievable support. Um, without David and Julie and the foundation, this project would have been a dream that never happened. Um, and you know, we talk about. I remember a year ago, we all stood in the in wearing hard hats with our bright colored vests on uh, with that ceremony to name the theater. And that was just, was that just a few weeks before we all had to go inside I, for a while? I, yeah, that's um, probably one of the last things I did with a large group of people. But um, it's, been a, it's been an amazing year in the sense that construction continued uninterrupted, believe it or not. Um, but we ended up having a, a flooding issue that occurred in downtown Milwaukee that affected us and a lot of other buildings downtown that delayed us as well. But we didn't see a huge impact from COVID on the construction piece. Or the impact to us is basically people can't gather in large groups. So the performing arts were in many ways the first to stop and will be the last to come back. Um, and that's really, um, it's a really difficult time for all the arts in particular. Um, and it's this sort of a very odd time for us because we have this incredibly gorgeous new and old theater waiting for the people of Milwaukee to receive the gift that's been given to us and we're not able to fully utilize it yet. Mark, like all arts groups, MSO has had to adapt to the virtual world in which yeah. we live in. How have you gone about doing that? Tell us about MSO's reimagined season, which I understand is going to start this month. Well, the rehearsals are actually happening right now. and This Saturday is the first performance. And one of my one of my staff members said it perfectly. They said, we used to be an orchestra. Now we're a TV station that broadcasts chamber music <laughs> for the time being. So we have a wonderful um, set of remote control cameras that we were that we were wired for anyway, but, but purchased them earlier than we would have to do live broadcasts from our new theater. So right now we're going to be having concerts with no audience members at this point, but we planned it small. So there's only six musicians playing the first concert. And we're keeping them socially distanced from other. We have a testing protocol in place. They all go get tested before they come together, much like the NBA or the NFL does. And uh, but the thing that's been the most heartening is our supporters have stuck with us through this. We have seen when we, we put a budget together initially, thinking what is our earned revenue going to look like as people return tickets, and what is our contributed revenue going to look like as people well they're they're not playing what they used to play, so maybe I won't contribute this year. We have seen. I'm going to say a minimal drop off. It has been amazing the way people have stuck with us. And I think a big part of that is the excitement about the Bradley Symphony Center and sort of this bright new day for the people for the symphony in Milwaukee, because people are looking for something to look forward to at this point, something oh, to off in, the, off in the future. Yeah. So it just in general, 
What do you think arts groups look like after COVID? Are most groups going to survive this from what you've seen, or, or do you think we're going to see some groups shut down? Well, it's funny. I, I, I get this question a little bit, um, and I, I've sort of refined my answer to uh, what I would call a game theory answer. There's, there's two types of games. There's a finite game, which means you know who the players are, you know what the score is, and you know who's going to win, and then the game ends. And then there's the infinite game. An infinite game is, you know who the players and the rules are, but the game changes. And the trick is just to keep playing. And sometimes people drop out of the game because they lose either the will or the resources to continue playing. So restaurants exist in that infinite game. Restaurant closes, but usually another restaurant opens up in that place or another business opens there. And, the, and this sort of continues indefinitely. The arts have sort of a, a hybrid of that. I think that the larger organizations, every city has one symphony normally, one ballet company, one opera company, one art museum. I believe those organizations will continue after the pandemic and hopefully their value will be better appreciated because they were lost for a while. My biggest concern is the smaller groups that have like for instance, the, the modern art museum that's not as heavily endowed as the big museum. The, the music series that presents new composition, new music. Maybe those groups are a little bit more at risk because they didn't have the, the fundamentals in place before the, uh, but my hope is they'll be part of the infinite game of arts where, well, then another museum will pop up and another theater company will come in and another. So, so I, I don't think we're gonna see, we may see changes, but I don't think we're gonna see a wholesale reduction of what is available for people. Live performance provides a, such a great opportunity for shared experience and it strengthens our sense of who we are as a community. Uh, the pandemic notwithstanding, it seems that shared experiences to some extent anyway are slipping away with the rise of on-demand entertainment and social media. Uh, what do you think the loss of people coming together does for the fabric of society for our communities? Well. One area that's been pretty good at sustaining the coming together would be sports. Yes. There is one. Do you remember when uh, the NFL used to black out games if they weren't sold out in the town? Sadly, is, I sure do. So <laughs> it was a while. That was, that was that was false logic on their part, in the sense because the the two experiences are fundamentally different, and um, I. I love, and, and interestingly enough, the NFL also tried to give you that choose your own view thing. Do you remember that? Where you could have a bunch of different cameras and you could choose which one. People like that for about 15 minutes. And then they say, you know what? I want, I want a professional to pick the pictures for me. So that's a curated experience where your experience is controlled by someone else. But when you go in person, you're able to look and see and feel how you want to, how you want to experience it. And that's, that's the way for my experience experience a symphony orchestra, a ballet company, an opera company, or even a museum. You know, looking at a painting in person, you cannot, there's no, you could get the most highest definition photo, but have it on your screen at home. It's not the same. And, but that's not a shared experience. I, I like to go to art museums by myself, honestly. But the idea of sitting in a concert with other people and experiencing it, and then the conversation afterwards, especially, especially art music, because Popular music is, um, I say, I mean, art music can be popular, but let's say entertainment music. Entertainment music tends to get categorized by, well, even your radio is in decades, right? So you go back to, it's static in time. So you hear that piece of music and you remember you back then, what your life was like back then and how you felt back then. Art music tends to grow with you over time. So when you hear a Beethoven symphony in your 70s, it's very different than how you heard it and what you felt when you were in your teenage years. And so you have to, that's an experience that I love to see people share with one another. And how did, how did this piece make you feel? What emotions, how did it move you? Because it's not about making you happy all the time. Sometimes music makes you incredibly sad or pensive or reflective or angry. And that's, and, and you see it the most, sorry, it's easier to see in children because children don't hide their emotions, right? As we grow up, we learn to put our mask on and not right. show our weakness or our emotions. Um, whereas you see children, you can almost see the music happening to them as, as it's as on their face. And it's wonderful to see adults go back to their, I would say their child's mind, so to speak. And it's, it's a more, it's a more, it's not an, a more innocent place. 
but I think it's a more open place and it's a place where you're listening. And in my opinion, there, we could use a lot more listening right now um, in our world. There's no question. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the theater a little bit. Uh, M Milwaukee really does seem to value historic to value historic preservation, even in an era where everyone seems to be modernizing everything. Sure. Uh, when you went through your search and your, your search for a, a new home, was it important for you for the symphony to preserve an old building, the, the old Warner Grand Theater here in Milwaukee, uh, to so, turn it into your new home? And, and uh, if so, how do you envision that site contributing to the revitalization of downtown Milwaukee, particularly in a part of downtown that has struggled to find an identity? Sure. So I'm going to admit, initially, the historic preservation piece was not on our minds at all. We The symphony was, the symphony had an existential risk to our existence because we were getting pushed out of our home. Uh, there was a Broadway series that was very successful and Milwaukee should also have Broadway, but trying to put the symphony, the ballet, the opera and the Broadway series all in one room was not sustainable long-term. So all I wanted was 1,600 to 1,800 seats where we control the schedule. And, and we were so desperate, I didn't care where it was. So, and we actually flirted at one point with a, a, a site on the lakefront near the uh, Discovery World, our science museum. There was a, a development being built there, the couture development, that at one point had a uh, public use doctrine issue. And we thought, well, if we put the symphony there, maybe that will relax that. So there was talk at one point of having the symphony be part of the couture project. Now, that sailed a long time ago. But that conversation really got the, um, the community interested in, well, what, what can we do? And um, we had investigated the Bradley, sorry, I'm, I'm habitualized. I call the Bradley Symphony Center back, even though it wasn't, the Bradley Symphony Center back then, that, that the Grand Theater um, back in the uh, 2000. And we actually did an acoustic test in there um, and the, it sounded great, but it, it didn't go forward at that time. So then we returned to that idea of repurposing a historic movie theater. Um, and you're right, it is, so then, then the, and the reason I think our campaign for fundraising for this project was successful is because it wasn't just about the symphony. So clearly, we had a business model issue in our old place. And because our revenue streams were not rationalized, we were overly dependent on contributed revenue because we couldn't earn the revenue in the space because we couldn't get in there during the weeks that were the most lucrative. But once we became, once we took the case, the case for support from being um, strictly about rationalizing the symphony's business model to Oh, and also saving an amazing historic gem in Milwaukee that likely would have been torn down if we hadn't entered into it. And then on top of that, being a catalytic project in Milwaukee's former downtown sort of area, you know? Um, and so between the economic redevelopment of West Wisconsin Avenue, historic preservation of the most beautiful theater in Milwaukee, and saving the symphony's business model, that was enough of a, a, a case for us to move forward. Um, and uh, the, that part of West Wisconsin Avenue where the theater is, is Milwaukee's main street from the past. If you see a photo of the Brewers winning the pennant in 1970s, the parade goes right through there. There's even old photos after World War II on VE Day of celebrations on West Wisconsin Avenue. It is, it's our main street. And about 25 years ago, as the demographics in downtowns changed and people fled to the suburbs because everybody wanted a you know a ranch and a two-car garage and you know, all that uh the downtown suffered and we have seen now in the last say five to ten years the returning of millennials and boomers at the same time coming together to live downtown and they want they want stuff they want the amenities they want grocery stores they want theaters they want bars they want restaurants and this particular part of West Wisconsin Avenue where our theater is located was not seeing the same amount of influx as other areas. It was actually, I called it a donut bowl because all around was really booming, right. but it needed a jolt. And once the, once the symphony center was announced and approved, other projects beat us. They're ahead of us, but they've all said, we only did this because the symphony's coming, even though they've already opened and we haven't yet. So it's, it's pretty neat. Yeah. It's exciting for Milwaukee. Yeah. Last question, Mark. Sure. Uh, can, you, can you tell us anything at all about 
the symphony's plans for a public opening of the Bradley Symphony Center once we get past this pandemic and it's safe to do so? So this all depends on where you live. <laughs> because I talk to my colleagues around the country. The folks on the coasts don't think we're going to have a normal season even in September, October, November. Um, like, for instance, I don't think the Los Angeles Philharmonic or the San Francisco Symphony are going to play live music at, at all this season. Um, folks in the middle of the country seem to think maybe we have a shot at it. So it's really difficult because I, I, we all crave that opening night where everyone comes in and we give David and Julie the bow they richly deserve. We give the Bradley Foundation the bow they richly deserve and our other fantastic supporters. Um, but we're basically waiting to see when it's safe to do that. But if you if you said, Mark, you have to give me a date, you have to tell me, I would say it's probably gonna be like October 1st, 2nd or 3rd of 2021. Most everything we do this spring is gonna be socially distanced, small, and probably not regal enough, so to speak, when it comes to density of people to have that right. celebratory thing. So that that's my guess, but I hope I'm wrong. I hope that the vaccine takes off and everybody takes it and it works great and everybody wears their masks and we see ourselves in, in May or June in a situation where we feel we, it's the time to do it. And if that's true, we'll do it. Because if there's one thing we've learned during COVID, it's pivot, pin, pivot. pivot fast, <laughs> pivot fast, yeah. Well, Mark Niehaus, thanks so much for joining us on We the People. I've, I've had the privilege of uh, walking through the Symphony Center and it's it's just terrific. I know the people of Milwaukee and, and I hope People from all over the country have an opportunity to see the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra at the Bradley Symphony Hall. It'll be a treat for all of us. Great, and uh, thank you, thank you again for your support. Uh, it wouldn't have happened so. without you guys, and I cannot wait to welcome everyone into the building to uh, have a great time. Thanks so much, and thanks to all of you for joining us on this episode of We the People. Mm -hmm.